Uh, my name is Brendan Scott and I'm the historian in residence uh, for Calvin County Council and as part of the Decade of Centenaries programme I've been recording a number of these short webisodes uh, in which I discuss the various events, peoples and themes which arise in Calvin during the early 1920s. And the subject of this webisode is uh, the GEA in Cavan during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly during that sort of period that we're looking at now, the 1910s into the early 1920s, with a particular focus on football and uh, its impact on politics and the politics and the impact of politics on football itself as well. Now, as we know, uh, the GEA was founded in his hotel in Thurlis in 1884. But and even from its earliest days, a lot of the rhetoric and thinking behind the GEA was nationalist and political in nature. The GEA and the organization of indigenous sports in Ireland would be used as one more string in the bow being aimed at the dismantling of British rule in Ireland. So this is a sort of a point of a resurgence uh, of an interest in, in, in Celtic uh, uh, ideas of, of this new, uh, a newly discovered uh, uh, grow for Irish and, and Irish nationalism and Gaelic culture and so on. And the GEA, and this is all part of the move in the Celtic revival, this move against uh, British rule in Ireland. And the GEA was being used as another, as I say, an, another string on, on the bow uh, being aimed at the disestablishment of British rule in Ireland. Now, there is a danger that you can over amplify that uh, within the, the, think, uh, the, the thinking behind the GEA and behind the, the, the reasons for its foundation. Uh, but it is nevertheless an important consideration to always keep in mind when we're thinking about uh, the the foundation of the GEA. Now, football and hurling had been played in Cavan and around the country uh, long before the GEA ever came into existence. And there are reports of games in Killincare, Knockbride, Curla, Mullahorn, Gauna, Castle Tara, Kildallan, Arva, Drumlane, Kingscourt, Drumgoon, Baileyborough, and Mulla all before 1884. So you're really covering the length and breadth of the county there. And, uh, but, but these, they were quite rudimentary. The rules were oftentimes kind of made up there and then, and uh, they were often quite violent as well. And they were on the decline really when the GEA revitalized and reorganized sport in the county. And uh, the, the first club, as we know, to be founded in uh, Cavan was uh, the Ballyconnell uh, Joe Biggers, uh, which were founded either in late 1885 or early 1886. And of course, Joe Bigger was a West Cavan Home Rule MP. Um, so already uh, the, the clubs are aligning themselves to nationalist politics. Uh, now, they very, very quickly changed their name to the Ballyconnell Force Ulsters. Um, and, and, and we're very, very proud uh, uh, to have that uh, title. Now, by 1889, there were 34 clubs established in Cavan, and virtually all of those names uh, were political or nationalist in, 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 in nature. And if we're to just look at uh, some of the names uh, that, that we have here, uh, the Baileyborough Home Rulers, the Kill and Care Defenders, the Virginia Sarsfields, the Cavan Slashers, uh, the Milltown Owen Rose, uh, the Belturbet Rory O'Murs, my own home club, uh, the Drumkilly Parnells, the Kildallan Wolf Tones. These are all names uh, uh, that are associated either with uh, nationalist organisations or nationalist heroes, like the like Cavan Slashers is, is Miles the Slasher. Uh, this kind of mythical uh, uh, figure. Uh, the Owen Rose, obviously Owen Rowe O'Neill. Uh, the Rory O'Murs, uh, Rory O'Murr, who was one of the, the ringleaders of the 1641 Rising. Uh, the Wolf Tones, obviously, the Parnells, and so on and so forth. So so immediately from the start, like, like if you think of, of English soccer clubs, like they don't really have kind of national, you know, nationalist or political 
uh, names, you know, in, in the way that a lot of these uh, uh, gala clubs would have. Uh, so it's quite interesting just to see how, from the very beginning, the GEA is tying itself up in, in this kind of political rhetoric. Um, and, and in fact, we have a photograph here of the Calvin Slashers from 1917. And I must thank as well, before I forget, uh, Dermot Walsh uh, from Calvin, who supplied me with all of the photographs that I'm using uh, in, in this PowerPoint. So thank you very much, Dermot, uh, for that. So politics was always there, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say, in the GEA. And many of the early games were, were uh, disrupted by the RIC, uh, for contravening uh, the Sunday Observance Act. That was usually a front, really, for harassment, uh, for harassing the Catholic Irish population, really, uh, was what was going on there. But they were using this Sunday Observance Act as a front uh, to, to carry out harassment. Uh, by the early 20th century, uh, for various reasons, uh, interest in the GEA in, in Ulster uh, was waning. But we did win the championship in, 19, in 1904, so, so that, that's good. And that's uh, the 1904 uh, Ulster champions, uh, the Cavan uh, uh, champions there. Uh, in 1912, only four counties were represented at the Ulster Convention. And in that same year, when Cavan played Armagh in the Ulster semi-final, Cavan didn't even have a full set of jerseys. Some of them had to just play in the clothes that they that they uh, brought with them, so they couldn't even tag in. Like the, that was how badly organised it was uh, uh, by you know in nineteen twelve or so. And in the following year, in nineteen thirteen, the Irish Volunteers uh, were formed, and that took up the time of many young Irishmen. And it's obvious, I think, that the turbulence of these years took a toll on the GEA and its membership because they just they were spread too thin. There was too much going on at this time. And, and as well, the political situation. In 1916, for example, uh, in the aftermath of the Easter Rising, the authorities in Cavan banned all football matches until the end of June for fear of there being further unrest in the county. They didn't want large groups of people congregating for football matches in the fear that they may be congregating for some other reason. So all matches were banned uh, until the, the uh, June uh, 1916. Uh, that's just a, a, a photograph of the Cavan team in 1914. And I like how the captain there, it doesn't have an armband. He's got a jersey that says captain. That's very nice. They're playing Leitrim uh, in, in that particular match. And you can see one of the Leitrim guys behind uh, standing in the background there with the green and yellow. Now, so if, if, we, if we carry on, Personalities, I think, as well as politics, played their part in the development of the GEA and Cavan in the early 20th century uh, and oftentimes had a negative effect uh, because in 1917, Cavan began to threaten to leave Ulster and join Connacht uh, for its competitions due to a, disport, uh, a dispute that the county board, that the Cavan County Board was having with the Monon County Board, in particular, a dispute that they were having with Owen O'Duffy. Uh, feeling that their next door neighbours were wielding too much influence and power in, in Ulster, in the province. And uh, they, were, they were basically saying, we're going to take our ball and we're going to go over to Connacht and play over there instead. Now, uh, that didn't happen. They stayed on. And in July 1918, uh, Cavan were drawn in the second round of the Ulster Championship against Armagh. And that match was to be played in Coot Hill. Uh, but the game was postponed. But Cavan didn't hear about this until the morning of the match when word came from the RIC, uh, Barracks and Cavan, that the match was not to be played. But at, at that point, you know, there was no WhatsApp groups and it was impossible to get the word to everybody uh, at that time. And so, so most of the Cavan players arrived in Good Hill, bar the ones from Cavan Town who found out from the Barracks in Cavan Town that the match was not to be played. Uh, all of the Armagh players were there. They'd come down the night before. Uh, so the Ulster Council refused a permit then to hold the match and the British military occupied the pitch and threatened force if the crowd did not disperse. So there's obviously a crowd there to watch the match as well. Things were getting a bit hairy and the British military occupied the football pitch uh, and said disperse or things may get uh, 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 violent. Uh, now, thankfully, Cavan won Ulster that year as well, so it wasn't all bad news. But these are the sort of things that are happening, you know, and uh, very disruptive, obviously. Uh, and the, the War of Independence as well, we have to remember, was looming on the horizon. But even before that happened, 
the thorny question of allegiance to the Crown and membership of the GEA was playing out across Ireland. Civil servants and teachers and other such people who were uh, employed by the state, for example, uh, they were required to take an oath of allegiance to the British state. And the GEA Central Council in December 1918 ruled that all such people who had taken that oath should be suspended from the GEA. So again, this political uh, uh, motivation uh, uh, there all the time. And that suspension met with great resistance and opposition, but not on the grounds of, you know, hey, we, we love the British and we should be able to have the oath and uh, and, and still play football or whatever. But the, the, it, was, uh, it was opposed on a technicality that the Central Council had no right to do that without consultation with the county delegates. And Cavan uh, was particularly vocal in this matter, opposing uh, uh, the ban that had been brought in on these tech on this technicality. Uh, but once the War of Independence began in 1919, a certain amount of disruption entered into everyone's lives, obviously. Uh, yet the 1919 and 1920 Calvin County Championships were completed on schedule. But other counties weren't so lucky, of course, and uh, the events of Bloody Sunday in Croke Park on the 21st of November 1920 uh, cast a huge pall over Irish life at this time. And a number of Calvin men were at Croke Park uh, on that fateful day, including Sean Sheridan from Balagna and MJ Lynch from Bailiabar, uh, who was on the county board as well. And we'll hear from Sean Sheridan in a moment, but here's what Lynch had to say to the anglo Celt the following week about what happened in Croke Park. This is what he says. The first volley of rifle fire came without warning of any kind from the canal bank. Michael Hogan, full back on the Tipperary team, fell dead within a few feet of Mr. Lynch. Following the, open, the opening volley, fire was poured in from all around the ground and was maintained for 30 minutes. The ensuing scenes indescribable. The main entrance gates were forced by armoured cars and the enclosure rapidly filled with the armed forces. So you can imagine you know, the terror and chaos that there must have been in Crow Park that day. It was such a dreadful uh, event. And as I say, cast a, a huge shadow uh, over uh, our, our relationship uh, with Britain and our sporting relationship with, with Britain as well. And then uh, Sean Sheridan from Balagna, who I mentioned a moment ago, was attending St. Enda's School in Rathfarnham at the time. And he was also in Crow Park that day. But following the shootout, Sean managed to get out of Croke Park and escaped to a flat on Mary Street uh, for safety. Now, what's interesting about Sean is that it was his brother, Tom Sheridan, who had been killed outside Balagna only a few months earlier in May of that year. And Tom, as some of you may remember, was the subject of the very first webisode uh, that, that I had. And not only had Tom died in that particular uh, uh, incident, uh, but as we learned in that first webisode, he had another brother, Packy, who had also been wounded and had been brought to Jervis Street Hospital under a pseudonym. Now, following his discharge from hospital, Packy had gone on the run. And this flat on Mary Street that Sean went to uh, was owned by a Fitzpatrick family from Balagna. And that flat had been used by Packy on occasions as a safe house. And Sean went there as well, hoping that Packy might be there. But Packy actually wasn't there at that time. He was down the country somewhere else. Uh, but so it's interesting just to see Sean uh, uh, and the Sheridan family uh, turning up again uh, in one of these extraordinary events in, in, in Irish history. Now, the War of Independence uh, continued apace into 1921. And even th though things were relatively quiet in Cavan in 1920 and 21, there were still incidents occurring which were unwelcome reminders of the times that were in it. Uh, in May 1921, for example, there was a match going on between Drumkilly and Ballymacue, and that was interrupted when British forces commandeered a number of men at the match and had them fill in trenches which had been dug on the sides of the road by the IRA. So the match was on, the army come in and just grab a bunch of men uh, uh, who were at the match and say, get out there now and fill in those trenches uh, that the IRA had dug. And around the same time, a match played in Belturbet between Belturbet Rory O'Meurs uh, and Drumbo uh, was disrupted when the army surrounded the pitch and searched and interrogated men uh, who were at the match. So again, very disruptive sort of stuff going on. Now, the Civil War uh, was another disruptive event uh, in Ireland. And the militaristic times, again, can be seen in the winning prize of what was called the GEA Great Challenge football match 
which was set for the 14th of May, 1922. And the prize uh, uh, for this competition was a Thompson machine gun. That was the first prize. And the match was being played uh, between the C and D battalions of the number three brigade, the 5th Northern Division. And the ball was being thrown in by Commandant General Hogan. So it was a military thing, really, rather than just like a, a regular GA uh, thing. And even though the Civil War was extremely divisive, the GA and Cavan managed to remain, thankfully, relatively civil. And the county secretary at the 1923 county convention, for example, gave thanks uh, that he said, both on the field of play and in the council chamber, men holding the most pronounced and divergent political views were, under the banner of the GEA, able to leave aside these views and work together, play together, or meet on the friendly rivalry of our national pastimes. And this, this obviously worked well uh, because Calvin then won the Ulster Championship in 1924-25, and there they are. And there's the great uh, Calvin Captain Jim Smith in the uh, front and centre there uh, behind the cup. Uh, was was a, a great footballer from Kill and Care. Um, but the tensions were undoubtedly there. And in the post-Civil War period, I mean, for example, Jim Smith uh, uh, joined, joined the guards and after that as well. So you can imagine then there are some people that he was probably playing with or playing against you know, that were on the other side of, 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 the, of the fence in terms of politics. So it must have been quite hairy uh, in, in ways, but, but this doesn't seem to have gotten in the way, as I say, um, in the 1923 convention, uh, they, were, they were very positive about how well everybody was working together in Cavan. Uh, but the tensions, as I say, were undoubtedly there. And in the post-Civil War period, some Republicans were hoping that they could enlist the GEA as an organisation in their struggle against the newly created free state. And for a brief period, the IRA were giving serious condition, consideration to attempting to take control of the GEA. And they were encouraged in this by the fact that uh, Kerry and Limerick refused to play in the 1923 All-Ireland Final uh, as, a protest, as a protest against the incarceration of over 10,000 Republican prisoners. Uh, IRA volunteers were told to approach county team and county board members and encourage them to call for county resolutions demanding the release of Republican prisoners and to boycott GEA competitions until their demands were met. And there were also uh, numerous complaints from Republicans about how many members of the Gardaí and the Free State Army, as I say, Jim Smith, uh, were prominent members of the GEA as well. And one Republican argued that it was hypocrisy that RUC men couldn't play GEA, but that members of the Southern Police and Army who upheld the 26 counties, i.e. a British position in this Republican's eyes, uh, that they could be members of the GEA and frequently hold uh, uh, prominent positions. Now, this isn't necessarily everyone's view, but this was one a prominent Republican's view that, that, the, that uh, the RUC couldn't play GEA, yet these guys who are supporting uh, the establishment and implementation of a 26 county state could play GEA when really uh, the, this, this guy's idea was that these fellows uh, uh, are not true Republicans, are not true Gales, are not true Irishmen because uh, they were supporting a 26 county republic rather than a 32 uh, county state. Uh, but the IRA were never really in a strong enough position to take over the GEA. And certainly in Cavan, politics uh, from this point on generally took a back seat, particularly as Cavan's glory days in football uh, were just a few short years away. And the focus usually was solely on the success uh, on the pitch. And so I, I just want to round off just by, uh, again, as usual, pointing people uh, to where they can go to have a wee look at uh, more material if you're interested in doing so. Uh, Dan Glogley, obviously uh, a, a, a great football man, uh, wrote a, a lovely book, Calvin's Football Story, which came out just uh, over 40 years ago. Uh, Donald McAnallen, David Hassan and Roddy Hegarty have edited a really good book called The Evolution of the GEA, which is a lovely bunch of essays, which uh, Cardinal Sean Brady uh, has an essay in that book. Brian McCabe, uh, originally from Virginia, uh, has a, an essay basically spanning the, the origins of the GEA and Calvin up to 1947 with the uh, New York final. Uh, and he wrote that essay in a book edited by myself and Jonathan Cherry uh, called Calvin History and Society. 
uh, which came out what six or seven years ago, I think. And uh, an old teacher of mine, Gerald Tui uh, from NUI Galway, edited a wonderful book uh, called "The GEA and Revolution in Ireland, 1913 to 23," and that came out five or six years ago as well. And really good, uh, really strong on on the political situation at the time. And there are a number of other books as well uh, that that give a lot of of, of material as well. Um, on on this period and the anglo celt as well always is a treasure trove uh, of information as well and you know you, you can access all of these books uh, from the Cavan library service and they're all you know they're, they're they're all there and you can check them out anytime you want uh, so i urge people who are interested in this to have a wee look there too as well uh, so just to sum up again as usual my thanks uh, to Cavan County Council, and in particular, uh, the Cavan Library Service, and in particular in there, uh, the County Librarian, Emma Clancy, and some of the staff there, uh, in particular, Jonathan Smith and Sinead McArdle, who are, as always, uh, a great help and support to me when I'm putting these uh, webisodes together. Uh, we, we have one or two more to go uh, before we finish up this series, and I really want to thank everybody who has watched these so far. I'm blown away by... Uh, uh, the interest there has been in these and uh, how many people have been watching them. I'm really um, amazed in, in, in the nicest way. And, I, you know, it's lovely to see that uh, support. And I just want to thank everyone really sincerely uh, for watching and for sharing them and uh, for liking the posts on Facebook and where else. And, um, you know, and I hope you've enjoyed this one and I hope you continue to enjoy the few more uh, that, that we're going to have. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you.